Hi, my name is Gia Hamilton, and thank you for joining me for Live Your Purpose Artfully, a video series that looks at creatives and innovators who are living, working, and visiting the city of New Orleans. So, I'm excited to sit with you today because uh, this is a long time coming. Um, I've really wanted to interview you for quite some time because we've been working together. So, for eight, nine, ten years now? Something I think like I met that. you in 2009. 2009. Okay. Almost yeah. ten years. <laughs> okay. So, I'm joined by L. Kasimu Harris. Yeah. Tell us what the L stands for. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> He's not telling us. <laughs> A name that I just have never really liked. No. Yeah, nor my parents actually. Really? Yeah. My uh aunt suggested the name. Okay. To my mother and I guess she was an acquiesced and uh so she never really I didn't know that was my first name until I was thirteen. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I always knew it was my middle name or thought. Okay. So I didn't start going by L. Cosimo Harris until graduate school. I like it. I like yeah, it. It's very yeah. distinct. Right, yes. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. So, tell me a little bit about um, just like your career trajectory. I know. I know a little bit, and I think when I met you, I knew you as a writer. Right. Yeah. So, tell me a little bit. You studied journalism. Is that right? For undergrad, I went to school. Originally, I wanted to be a music producer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So out I, there making beats. I. You know what? My favorite part of being in the studio was break. Oh. So I was like, this ain't for me. <laughs> uh, and then I rolled that into entrepreneurship. Okay. So I graduated with a degree in entrepreneurship. But because I was a mass comm major, I had so many hours. Some point, I started working for the student newspaper, and I got a, a double minor in business and entrepreneurship. No, business and mass comm. Okay. And when I went to graduate school, I was trying to figure out to get an MBA or something else. So I got uh, a master's in journalism. Ah, right, right, that's right. where the journalism comes in. Right. Okay. Right. right. And so, like, what kind of things were you writing? What was what was important to you when you first started? Uh, I think the first thing I wrote about in two thousand one was uh, sports. I wrote yeah. about a uh, I wrote about a volleyball game, tennis match. Yes. A tennis match, and then I started writing a, a column. And I remember I wrote about a boy who unfortunately was murdered here in New Orleans. I was in Middle Tennessee State at the time. So I'm writing for Side Lines newspaper. It's about 2001, 2002. And I wrote about a little boy. I just remember his first name was Ishmael, which mm. means God hears. So it was a domestic dispute with his mother and the mother's boyfriend. And he was trying to help. And like no one helped except this little nine-year-old boy. And it just moved me to write about it. And then I just continued to write it. I started doing feature writing and things like that. So when I went to graduate school, I had it in my mind that I wanted to write for a newspaper for about a few years and then move over to uh, feature writing for magazines. So this was 2005, okay. uh, 10 days before Hurricane Katrina. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, I was at University of Mississippi and I was uh, a TA for a photographer. And you know, I had to take a photography class and that is the year that I also added photography to the repertoire. Uh, so, because he made me come back to New Orleans, wow. which I hated, didn't want to come back to New Orleans. So, this is 45 days after Katrina. And, uh, you know, I had a reporter's notebook and a tape recorder, but it was the camera that really allowed me to, in some sense, work through things myself, being a native of the city, yeah. as well as quickly tell stories. And you hear other people who kind of move from one medium, like Roy Decarava, he was a uh, he used photography as references for painting, but then it was the the immediacy of photography that stuck with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, <clears throat> so that's that's really, again, what I came to know you as this photographer in the city, this local photographer who was capturing just all of these really interesting scenes, things that like places that I knew, but I had to look at in a different way. So tell me about like when you first started working on like your own photo series. Uh, mm, probably after Katrina. Yeah. Because I had survivor's remorse in a sense mm -hmm. that I wish I could have been here in New Orleans 
and telling those stories. But I, I didn't, I didn't have the proper tools at all. Absolutely. Uh, even any places to send images or stories. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted, so I did my thesis all on rebuilding, rebirth of the city. So I was very intentional in the images that I saw. Like uh, I felt that there was a lot of parachute journalism, people coming in, not telling a fuller story. And sometimes the nature of media and the news cycle doesn't really allow for these fuller stories. So I wanted to show different kind of things that were happening in New Orleans. And that's pretty much where uh, working on a long-term project started. Uh, and you're right, very right. Uh, at this time, I'm still was more known for writing, and I'm not. Uh, probably up until maybe 2011 or 2013, uh, and for me, it was like a battle, yeah, uh, internal battle because uh, initially people would introduce me as a writer. Like, yeah, oh, he's a writer. He's a writer. I'm like, well, I could do photography too. <laughs> And then it turned to where he's a photographer, he's a photographer, and I'm like, I could do writing too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Donald Glover has changed this for everybody, yes, right? Yes. He's like, I'm this, I'm a comedian, yeah. I'm an actor, I'm a rapper, I'm at all these things, I right? I love that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So now we get to just be yeah. all of the creative things that we, right. that we want to be. You know, you said 2011, and actually I think that was the first time we got to work together. Right. Um, on the show Invisible Man. Right. Um, you know, I hadn't, I was still a newer curator and mm. was kind of thinking about like the types of shows that I wanted to put out there in the world, the type of people I wanted to work with. Um, and like you, had come back to the city and was really just thinking about like my own place and contribution. Right. Um, also very much thinking about um, the exoticism of being back. Right. And like what that afforded me, right. um, but and so it became like really important to think about like working with men, working with women who um, were not immersed in like the local contemporary art scene, right. um, and like just creating our own scene, right. you know, and and really trying to create spaces for the work to be seen. Um, and that show in the Invisible Man, um, I worked with what was it eleven. Men, some of whom it was their first show, they had never exhibited work before. Um, and I remember we had both a dinner and we had um, a panel discussion. Do you remember that at all? I remember the panel. It was the first time I met your parents. Yep. yep. Who were very proud. Yeah, yeah. Sitting in the front row. Yeah. Yes. Tell me a little bit about, like, how did that feel working with, you know, or, or just even seeing that many black men work all in one space? Well, for me professionally, at the time, it was the biggest show I had been in, as well as the most images. I think you selected six images, four or six. Uh, and most of the shows I had done up to that point were group shows, and it was I was probably the only black man. Uh, or, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, because I came up in jazz... I'm always about the democracy and the group dynamic. I really love it. Uh, and when you get to, uh, everyone is trying to do their best individually, but it's within a collective of trying to make a group sound good. Yeah. So, and I think that in that type of situation, everyone should raise each other's level. Uh, Giant Coltrane wants to sound as good as Miles, as good as Cannonball. Yeah. Uh, so that's how I look at it. So it was, for me, having said all that, it was a very gratifying experience to uh, to find your tribe, to see yeah. who else is out there doing work. And, uh, you know, you could you could be uh, vulnerable with someone like, oh, this is my first show, or, you know, I hadn't done anything like this either. Like, yeah. okay, you know. So it was a very uh, pleasing and very memorable experience for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad, I'm glad. I was... I was thinking a lot about, <clears throat> for, for you all, in my relationship to you all, like, the fact that I'm constantly in situations where I'm with all males, like, mm -hmm. I'm a mom of all boys, right. you know, and, like, really wanting to explore this idea of, like, the invisibility of, like, the black male body, um, the black male experience as being, like, 
hyper visible and then invisible at the right, same time. Right, right. Um, you know, and I think about your images that I constantly see are, it's interesting. They feel like everyday people and sometimes these aspects of mundane life. Mm-hmm. But then I know that just the person that you are and the artist that you are, that they're, they're, they're these backstories. Right. What is a backstory to maybe a relationship that you have with one of the subjects or someone that you've selected to be in a photo? Like, how did you, how do you make those determinations as a photographer? Ah, you know, it just depends on the photo. Yeah. And I, I try to give you some exact examples. So if it's a, something more of a photojournalism, it's just the moment that happened in yeah. our lives intersected at that point. Uh, there's this photo I have called Seventh Ward Chess Club, and it's three men playing chess against this red house, probably on Dirge Walk, kind of close to St. Bernard Avenue. So I saw them, and I just was so moved by them. Yeah. You know, so they were, they were, they weren't in suits or ties. One of, they probably both had on jerseys, jeans, shorts, flip flops, but they were like dealing with this game of chess. Yeah. So I just approached them and I said, "May I take your photo? I'm Casimo. I'm from down the street. I don't know quite what I'll do with this photo yet, but may I please take it?" And he was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead." <laughs> and I just took the photo, and uh, I also kept in touch. Got their number. One of them has come to see the photo back at the McKenna, actually. Wow. And uh, so that was very gratifying for me. Uh, a more intentional photo may just be someone I know. Uh, there's this photo I took, The Road Ahead, with Malcolm Jenkins. So that's a, that's a very staged photo. Yeah. Uh, but it just came out of me knowing him. And uh, I wanted to shoot in an old, classic looking car. Mm-hmm. I just had this vision. The vision actually was to have a sofa out on the Mississippi River from the West Bank looking to the East Bank. I, I, I started wanting to do these uh, paradoxical things, uh, profound, juxtaposed with profane. Uh-huh. So I did it one time with you again in a sense yeah. when I shot uh, Alice Marcellus and Delphi Marcellus outside the John Mitchell Center. Yes. Right. So we had a piano out there. So these visual things that you're thinking of that may not work together. So back to the Jenkins photo. I couldn't get the sofa, I couldn't get all this stuff in time. So I called uh, Ted's Frost Stop because I knew they had classic cars on Fridays and the lady just was working for me as if she worked for me. Wow. And someone came out there with a classic car and it's become a, I guess, an iconic image. It's in a Daniel yeah. Nine book, it was in a New York Times uh, story. So that's some of the different ways where photos come together. And some may just be family where yeah. I see a moment, but uh, it's, each one has a very different process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You segue yourself very well, because I was going to ask you about Dandelion. <laughs> <laughs> and like our, this, this small community, I feel like we were kind of the almost expat right. New Orleanians of this, you know, of our generation who had right. moved back. And there was this moment in time right. where it was me, you and uh, Jewel Bush, another right. writer friend, and right. Chantrell Lewis, another right. curator. Right. Um, we were like, there was a scene. It was. Am I mistaken? Not there at was all. A scene. And yeah. I've worked with all three of y'all, and yeah. all three of y'all have had an impact on my life. Jewel with the Melanated Writers. So yes. that was a uh, that was a, a movement or a collective that really helped me to flourish as a writer. Yeah. Just being in that community you working with you with two shows yeah. and uh, just always having someone to to talk to. And then, of course, Chantrell, uh, I met all y'all the same night and three or four other people as well, yeah. all women who I still keep in touch with. Uh, and just to meet all those people at that same place and point in time and then to just continue to work with them. Yeah. And then to continue to see everyone, can, I don't want to say continue again, but just to excel at their career and to fulfill yeah. the dreams that they have and still have more dreams ahead of them. Uh, and it's just, one more time, it was just gratifying for me yeah. to, to have that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so you, you worked with Chantrell on the yeah. Dandelion right. um, project, which really, I mean, was this ongoing project really thinking about 
style. Yeah. Um, the 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 particulars of dressing, all of the rituals that go along with dressing. Right. Um, and just you know a particular aesthetic. Right. So you, my <laughs> friend, are a stylish man for sure. Thank you. Um, I, I I feel like I've watched your style evolve over time, right? And as you right. get older, I'm like I'm like yes, there's just like all these fun things that I see you doing. What what influences you? Do you feel you know you're from New Orleans? Do you feel like there's a Southern or New Orleans aesthetic or sensibility? Well, let me go back one second. Yes. One thing about Daddy Line. Yes. That's one of those times where I missed the boat the first time. You did. Oh yeah, she had a call, <laughs> and I just didn't submit. I was too intimidated to submit. And when it came back around again, and then when you saw the success of it. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's an interesting thing. We have these visions or we have these ideas that we share with people. And sometimes people may join us, sometimes not. And then when we execute it and you see what it became, this little small little idea, that's how I felt. Yeah. When it was at the Retro Effluence Museum, I was like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I was happy for her. Yeah, right. But I was like, I missed it. So it came back around again. That opportunity came back around yes. again, luckily. And with the Dandelion book, I was... Uh, Aziz, Abdul Aziz shot me. Yeah. And then I had about several pictures in the book. And where my style comes from, I would always, probably when I was younger, my sister, Rasana Ice, and she dressed me when I was younger, younger. <laughs> not now. Yeah, not, not now. now. She just uh, compliments you now. Yeah. Yes. Delphi or Marcellus, <laughs> I used to, I still love his style. Just yeah. Contrasted patterns, bold colors. Yeah. And then uh, probably once I got to college, it just was trying things. Right. And I'm always trying to be functional, too. You know, coming up in the walls in this heat, uh, you know, you're going to be weather appropriate. Yes. Um, and as far, and I remember I used to get teased when I went to school in Tennessee. Okay. Um, I would wear serious sucker suits and they said I looked like a railroad conductor. Yeah. And then when uh, Method Man and Red Man came to New Orleans, for like some type of two lane homecoming, everyone was like, "So man, where you got this tear sucker from?" Right. I'm like, Setting "Oh, trains. oh." Setting the yeah. trends. <laughs> and I do think our aesthetic has something to do with our uh, the heat and you know just being functional. And I think yeah. we're we're bold. We can be very bold. I think some of us are more daring than others, and I always appreciate those people. Yeah. And. Uh, you know, now I think it's the style of aesthetic in New Orleans is, is just more, sometimes it seems more global yeah. than it used to be. And it's, it's I think yeah. it's definitely people taking more risk. Uh, but you can see someone from New Orleans like, mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, can, you can hear them right. and you can see them. Right. Yes, yes. Right. So... So, are you also known as a stylist? Do you do stylist work? No, no. No? No, no. I've never even tried. No. I've never even tried. But I think style has been an important part in my life. Um, that 2000, 2000, 2011, 2012 year was great as well as very trying, uh, yeah. personally and professionally. Uh, I was underemployed and I was going through like a, just some, like a depression that yeah. I didn't you know, I eventually had a child from depression yeah. uh, that I love dearly. Uh, he's a cute man. He's, he's a, and yeah. well dressed. Right, right. <laughs> but I remember writing. I started writing for the Oxford American. Yes. So that was one of the things that we just have these moments that give you a bump in life. And it was a certain validation. So yeah. that gave me the opportunity to write about style as well as take pictures. And having that brand behind me really did a lot of things and I think as a result of that yeah. uh, I got a lot of other opportunities. I was in Southern Living, sub following that, traveling, leisure and um, it was nothing I sought out but I think just dressing well kind of just gave me another vehicle for expressing myself but it gave me a lot more opportunities. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of opportunity, <laughs> right now there is an opportunity to see your current work at the New Orleans Museum of Art right. uh, during this really amazing tricentennial show called right. Changing Courses. Right. So what has that experience been like to work with 
a large museum, both like in your home city. Um, tell us a little bit about the body, that body of work. Right. Well, uh, Changing Course Reflections on New Orleans Histories. It's a show that I knew I wanted to be in, but I didn't know it existed. I wanted to make a big, bold statement uh, for the Tricentennial, and I didn't know quite how I would do it. And uh, Russell Lord, I was at a New Orleans Photo Alliance meeting, and we were just chatting and chatting and chatting. He's a well-dressed man. He is. Yeah. Uh, so we were just chatting, and uh, he sent me a, an email like the next day, like, hey, I had a great time talking to you. Let's, uh, let's do lunch soon. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to be in New York when you want to do lunch. So then he said, okay, well, I want to talk more about your photos, so let me come to your studio. And then I was, it just lowered. I didn't know what that meant. I called Dawu Bay. I called Frank Rell, Relly, because I'm like, yes. I won't say panicking, but it's like, what but the hell? Bit. Yeah, what yeah. the hell does this mean? Yeah. So he came by, so I stayed up the whole night, you know, trying to fix up my studio. And he came by, and I printed out all this new work. Yeah. Like all this new work. The last thing I put up on my wall was from the One of the series. Wow. And it was uh, eight photos. Uh, there were, it's like a linear narrative. And what One of the is about, it's uh, a nonviolent coup d'etat of students who have become so frustrated with uh, the inequality in education that they take it upon themselves to start to educate. And they educate themselves. Uh, so that's what the series is about. And uh, you know, when Russell was walking around the studio, Grayson was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was my little docent, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, I'm, uh, he went through really quickly. And I'm like, damn, he didn't like anything. And he was like, so this is what I really want to talk about, the Warren of the Night and stuff. Wow. And he was like, is there any way I can see it bigger? They were, they were like proofs, like six by ten or something like yeah. that. And... Uh, I was like, well, they're at the printer around the corner. Would you like to go? Because they were going to a show that Larry uh, was curating. Yeah. Yeah, at Smack Mine. And um, we went to the printer. Yeah. And he's just looking at these photos, just looking at them. And I'm like, he took a, like about an hour. And I don't know, what what's he doing? So finally we get to the parking lot. And he's like, would you like to be in the show, the Trash and Tidio show? And I'm like, he said, would you consider and I'm thinking, like, consider, consider. yes. Yeah. I was about to cry at a parking lot. And my son's, like, Aww. excited. And I'm excited. So what does it feel like? I think it's the biggest opportunity I've ever had. Much like the show I was in with you in 2011, it was the biggest opportunity I had at an institution at the time. And now this is, I have 11 pieces in the show. Uh, I did five of them are from 2015 and six of them are from 2018. Uh -huh. So I expanded the series some more. Uh, it's still a linear narrative. It's still a narrative. Yeah. But we displayed it where the viewer has to do a little work. Uh, some of them are definitely you can look at it and understand what's going on. And some of them are what I call these um, X-ray visions or uh, dream-like kind of things. And I got that from looking at Romare Bidden's The Block, mm. where he had these X-ray look-ins. Yeah. So uh, maybe some cutaways that I have. Yeah. And one of them is called, like, Race to the Top, where we have four children on a track, uh, a track and field track, and they're sitting at a desk. And I'm really responding to these various things that come out of the, the White House. Uh, Race to the Top, War on Property, War on drugs, no child left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm trying to really highlight right. that. These catchphrases. These catchphrases. So good right. for politics. Right. It's right. Like, what do they really mean? Right. 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 On the ground. Yeah. Right. So, you know, hopefully this show begets other shows. And it was an honor for me to exhibit with someone like Willie Burge and Katrina Andrews. Yes. It's a, mean, a great group. Yeah. A great yeah. group. And, yeah. you know, it was it was amazing and great to see your name. I mean, I wanna I wanna shout you out a little bit because not only do you have work in the show, but you your image is the huge banner that as you walk you know into the park, like you see Al Casimo Harris's image, yeah. right? Um, yeah. That was selected, and so I mean that's also a big deal. 
right? Because this helps give people like this entry into right. what they're going to see, right, right, and what they need to be thinking about and the questions that they might have. Right. Um, I talked to uh, Brian Piper and Katie Wolf about it. Yeah. Uh, that it, it just was kind of a kismet thing that the exposed bricks on my photo, uh, where the children are about to go over the, a wall, yeah. right, a wall dividing them from a better life that you would receive with education. Yeah. Contrasted against the exposed bricks on the former uh, PT Borgard monument, and they talked about how in my photo you see these students glaring at that monument wow. and the whole connection to change the course. Now, that was unintentional, but that's the great thing about art where it lines up. And to see my image that big, I I, I can't get used to it, but I love it. <laughs> I remember seeing, hearing yeah. you say something like that. Yeah. This is just amazing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine when you just, when you have this, this visibility and you you're able to think more expansively um, about your work. And so, if resources were not an issue at all, right? You could just make work. Uh, what would you be thinking about? What would you make? What would you do? What would be important to you? Some of it would be telling the most mundane but fascinating stories. Yes. One I'm like, might, you know, there's this guy, uh, Reverend, uh, I think it's T.L. Barrett. Okay. Uh, he's out of Chicago. Okay. He's had a fascinating life. I became aware of his work because he, Kanye West, sampled his song, Father, I Stretch My Hand. Hmm. But I listened to the whole CD. It is amazing. He had this choir, a oh. uh, children's choir, and they played gospel music, but it was like so soulful and funky, so a lot of people sampled it. He's still alive in Chicago. He made millions of dollars, and he, he got in some trouble with money, and he's still flourishing. I want to go and talk to him. You know, yeah. he's a pastor, probably got some southern roots. You yeah. know, so we pastors just have that certain kind of vibe. Um, Absolutely. I'm very interested in bars right now, so I've started this. Uh, I've done some work about bars here in New Orleans that, yes. as it relates to gentrification. Uh, but I, there's a connection to beyond the black bars here in New Orleans that are vanishing. We, that relates to the jerk joints in Mississippi, to the Shabines in South Africa, yes. you know, to many places throughout the diaspora that I want to connect and tell stories, you know. But I don't just have that time <laughs> to just go. To just go? Right now on my own. Uh, so things like that, and obviously, um, you know, bigger productions. Yeah. Uh, so right now, I'm just depending on people. Like, I call my sister and sign, like, hey, can you do this? Or I call my partner, hey, I need you to pick this up. So if we had, well, I guess, more sophisticated ways to do things and just more to tell stories and to do projects like War on the um, yeah. that's what I want to do. I want to get to using multi-screens and yeah. uh, multi-projections okay. and uh, you know, educating myself on how to do that and then having the tools to do that. But if I had those resources, that's what would be getting done. That's what would be getting done. Yeah. Okay, we, well, the good thing is this will be time stamped. And so when you, when you get those resources, we'll be able to look back at this moment and say that you claimed it on this day. There we go. Yes. So what's next? What are you up to? What are you thinking about? The bar stuff. Yeah. Uh, I got a little research and development money from Platforms Grant. Excellent. So I'll go back and start doing that. In my private practice, in my studio, I've been doing some other things. I'm not ready to say what it is yet, but uh, I think it'll, I think it'll, hopefully it'll resonate with people and it'll be a, another deviation, including another way to communicate. Uh, so That's it's, exciting. That's really exciting. So. That's exciting. Can I can I tell you two bars that I really like? I don't know if you're okay. The Seahorse is right. over down the street, across from um, the first the racetrack. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. All an right. interest. It's an interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. space. Yeah. And then the Sandpiper. Oh yeah, uh, all Louisiana. Yeah. 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 yeah They're just yeah. two really. Yeah, that's the type of stuff I'm interested in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna go. You're going to go? Yeah, of Okay, course. maybe we have a drink there. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank you, for joining me. Thank okay. you. All right. <laughs>